Hi everyone, welcome to the Brown History Podcast. My name is Essen and this is episode 27. Our guest today is award-winning British science journalist Angela Saini. She's also an author of many books, but we're going to focus on her latest book. It's called Superior, The Return of Race Science. It's a wonderful episode. We talk about a lot of things. We talk about history, politics. We talk about this persistent need of classifying people within the science community. So sit back. And before we start, if you're enjoying the Brown History Podcast and if you're enjoying the Brown History Instagram page and you want to help out, you want to support, please do check out brownhistorypodcast.com. You can become a Patreon. You can do a one-time donation. You can buy some merchandise. There's a lot of ways to help. So let's start. Here we go. Thank you so much. But like, I mean, the credit goes to you. You did all the hard work. You went around talking to people and interviewing. You actually went to Paris to the zoo. And, you know, like, so that was really interesting, too. So uh, you grew up in England, right? Uh, race must have played a big factor in your childhood, in your upbringing. Yeah, it did. Um, so I, I was born in quite a multicultural part of East London. And then when I was around 10 years old, um, my parents moved to an area that wasn't nearly so diverse. Um, So me and my sisters, I have two sisters, um, we ended up being um, one of the few black or brown faces you would see see in the town. And that was when I became really conscious about race, Um, not least because the area where we lived was known for uh, the far right was quite active around there. Um, So there were a number of racist murders that happened in the 80s and 90s in that area. Um, One of the headquarters of one of the far-right nationalist parties was in the same town as my school. So that was my kind of induction into racism uh, because I was, you know, I was confronted with it every day. It's ironic that race is is like a made up thing. It's a social construct and there's no real definition behind it. But me and you being children of immigrants, race is a very real thing in our in our lives. It's kind of weird. Yeah. And and I think some people um, I mean, it's very easy when you think about your own identity to imagine that it's rooted in something that's deep inside you. That um, before I started writing Superior, I I had this conception that my Indianness was something that was rooted biologically within me and Mm. that you know wherever I went in the world wherever I lived and whatever culture I adopted that that Indianness would always be in me Um, and actually that's not the way biology works Um, there are no Indian genes there are no (laughs) black genes there are no white genes there's nothing that biologically pins me to India, which is why DNA ancestry tests are so fraught because um, the way it works is just by seeing where people who are related to you live. Mm -hmm. So if all my family lived outside India, I wouldn't look Indian at all by one of these DNA ancestry tests because there are no kind of Indian genes or Indian biology as such. Um, And when you divorce uh, race or ethnicity from that kind of biological aspect, which we imagine there to be, then what does identity become? What does culture mean? And I think, I imagine it's the same for you, but as a second generation immigrant, that was one of the things that I've spent a lot of my life grappling with. What does it mean to be British in my case, when so many people look at me and don't think of me as British? Yeah. Since, you know, speaking of there is no Indian gene, there is no black gene, and yet there is something called race science that you explore. For people who don't know, what is race science exactly? So the where our racial categories, the racial categories that we use now, and by that I mean the very broad color-coded racial categories like brown, black, yellow, red, um, they are no more than a few hundred years old. And they were concocted, invented at a time in history when Western European enlightenment scientists were looking at the world and saying okay we can classify plants and animals can we do the same with humans and um, the way that they did this because there are no natural subdivisions between humans we are one species but the way they did it was to look at the world and based on their assumptions which were again rooted in the politics of that time so this is the politics of slavery and colonialism think okay skin color because there were already emerging ideas at the time linking skin color to inferiority and superiority to power. And um, it became a very arbitrary 
way of dividing up people, but it stuck. And for hundreds of years, that became the basis for the science of human difference. Scientists started to explore the possibility that if you were black or brown or whatever color you were, that you were fundamentally different, that you had different psychological or behavioral qualities from other races. Um, to the point where in the 19th century, this was so ingrained within scientific thinking that um, there was a physician in the US, Samuel Cartwright, who invented a disease to describe the phenomenon of black slaves running away from their white masters. He called this drapetomania. Wow. Because in his conception, based on this science, this so-called science, pseudoscience, um, slavery or subservience was rooted in blackness and brownness so to see someone resist it then you, that was pathological and you had to kind of coin a disease to describe it so that's the way racism worked really science helped racism right the way through when i when i finished reading your book i've learned one thing i learned was that you could be really 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 smart but still be dumb enough to be racist there are a, a lot of people, you know, uh, take uh, James Watson, I think his name is. He won the Nobel Prize for figuring out the, the structure of DNA. Very smart guy, hardworking, lots of degrees, uh, influential, respected. And yet he got canceled because he kept saying that one race is genetically more inferior than another race. Why are these, you know, it 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 baffles me to think that you're so smart, but yet you are insisted, insisting on these assumptions. Why, why, is it why is it so necessary for them to, to really think like that? Well, that's a big question. And I think is, for me yeah. as a journalist, that has been, you know, even more interesting to me than how these racial categories were invented or what they mean genetically or what the biology is. More interesting for me is why do people cling to these beliefs even when all the weight of evidence doesn't support them? Mm -hmm. Why do even Nobel Prize winners want to believe that whiteness makes someone superior in every single way? Um, you know, James Watson is just one of many racist scientists who have uh, existed in the latter half of the 20th century. There were some who were eugenicists who thought that black women should be sterilized, for instance, who fully supported this idea of curbing immigration from certain countries because they thought that those countries had lower quality people. And there are still some people who think that now. Um, and, you know, what's fascinating is to try and understand that education is not just the you know that's not the easy way out of racism it just because someone is clever as you say or just because they're smart and they're well educated and just because they've won a Nobel Prize that doesn't stop them from holding deep-seated prejudices which can color them in the way that they think about everything else mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the work that I do is about how talks about how colonialism has as uh, hint slowed down our progress as as a people for all people of color in in the media in the arts, but it didn't it didn't occur to me that it could have slowed us down in science and not just like in the science field as in jobs and things like that, but the, the you know but in research. And I, I remember in the book you interviewed this archaeologist and he says something like the baggage of colonialism has weighed down the profession. Can you elaborate on what he means? What kind of baggage and how it's slowed us down? Well, I think the only way to really understand it is to go right back to the beginning. When you realize that the whole project of Western science, modern science, was built on this assumption that human beings could be divided into groups, that there, were high, there was a hierarchy between these groups so that certain races were higher up and certain races were lower, up, lower down, and that there was a ladder of progress, an evolutionary ladder of progress. Later on, this idea came that some of us are catching up with the races at the top, and some of us would never get there, that certain races were doomed to die out. I mean, this was the logic behind um, the one of the first laws in Australia against uh, Indigenous Australians, the white Australia policy was essentially predicated on this idea that they were doomed to die out anyway. They were going extinct because they would lower down this evolutionary ladder. Um, so colonialism and race science went hand in hand. This was an intellectual ideology that supported 
what was happening politically out there in the world. Um, and that is, I think, one of the ways in which it stayed alive, because obviously it's so vacuous as a morally, you know, colonialism, imperialism is so vacuous morally. How do you justify it? And this is how race science got recruited into this project. Not only did it inform the racist scientists of their time, but it also informed the politics of how colonialism then played out and how it was justified by those who were controlling other people. They could tell themselves, we are more civilized. We are better than you. We are fundamentally better than you and higher up on this scale. In the subtitle of your book, it says the return of race science. Where where did race science go and 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 how prevalent is it now in our society? Um, in a way, the return is not the right way to think about it because it never fully went away. But what did happen was after the Second World War, and especially after the Holocaust, when people could see um, the political ramifications of taking race science ideology to its limit, you know, that to try and eradicate people, to commit genocide based on this philosophy or this ideology. Um, it became very difficult then for scientists, for academia generally, to maintain this fiction. It wasn't cool um, anymore. Basically. It wasn't cool. It wasn't fashionable. And it race got taken out of biology. You know, race science stopped existing as it did in the 19th century and started to change its shape into the study of human difference in other ways. So rather than measuring people's skulls or their skin tone or these kind of really crude racist measures that they did before, now they would say, okay, we are one human species, but there is human difference. So how do we study human difference? And that's when they went to genetics and they went to other ways of studying, you know, the fine grained human difference. And that's, I think, this is what I argue is that that is how race stayed alive in science is in that study of human difference in other ways um, people didn't fully let go of racial categories and that's why today even in fields like population genetics in medicine you still see racialized ways of thinking and in archaeology and anthropology sometimes you'd still see racialized ways of thinking because there wasn't that clean break it wasn't as though people started again what they did was try and shift slightly and they retained some of those ideas from the past they didn't completely let them go it sounds like the language just changed and it became just more subtle but it's in still some there. ways language so in some ways it was just language but in other ways it was more fundamental so it isn't as though you know the kind of racist assertions that you saw being made routinely in the 19th century are being made now. But some of those ideas do still exist. I mean, it was only this year that the NFL here in the US uh, ended its practice of race norming. So for decades, when a black um, player in the NFL at the end of their career went for compensation based on head injuries, and you know, a lot of football players get head injuries by the yes. end of their careers. Um, it was assumed that black players had a lower baseline cognitive function based on their color than white players. Wow. And so they wouldn't necessarily get the same level of compensation or any compensation because of that. And it's only this year that the NFL has stopped that practice. So these ideas do live on, they're there, they're active. And that kind of thinking is maintained in science because it became so normal. It became so routine to think about people in this way. It's taking a long time to kind of extricate ourselves from it and stop thinking this way. That's crazy. All these research that's being, um, these studies that are being conducted to try to find the differences between us, who yeah. is funding them? Who Who is the one with the money here and, and giving it to them? Well, if we're looking at the very extreme end of racist science, um, then there have always been very wealthy racists willing to fund <laughs> racist True. academics. yeah. Um, so one of the stories that I look at in Superior is um, after the Second World War. So like I said, after the Second World War, there was this big shift. But there were a number of scientists who were not on board with what was happening, who still believed that we were not one human species, that race was real, that we should maintain segregation in the United States, for instance. They set up their own journal. It was called the Mankind Quarterly. And this was a vehicle for the kind of scientific racism that had been normal before the war. 
Um, and they included very prominent scientists in the UK, in the US, in other parts of the world, psychologists particularly. Um, and they were funded by um, a very wealthy segregationist called Wycliffe Draper. So there's a wonderful book on this um, by William Tucker called The Funding of Scientific Racism, which kind of looks into forensic detail at how this very wealthy man who had made his money partly, his family had made money partly through slavery, um, he was committed to maintaining segregation in the United States in the 1950s, 1960s. And he thought that if he could fund scientists who agreed with him and publications that agreed with him, that he could convince prominent conservatives to keep schools segregated and to keep, area, you know, keep society segregated. Um, and that pioneer fund that he created was operating into the 21st century. It's only Crazy. very recently that they ran out of funds. Wow. They were funding people, you know, who are still alive now. And they will find somewhere else to get their funds from. In fact, that's what the, the Mankind Quarterly is still in publication now. The editor of the Mankind Quarterly, who was the editor when I, when I was writing the book, he said to me, we'll just find another source of funding. There's always someone out there is willing to do this because there are so many people who are ideologically committed to proving that racial inequality is natural. That's incredible. Uh, it reminds me of a quote from Tenehasi Coates that says that he, and he says, first comes racism, then comes race. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just white people that group people together and then categorize them and then just kind of create a hierarchy of, of one is better than the other. There's a chapter in your book that where you go to India and you and you look at the caste system and you're talking to a man of science and he also kind of agrees with the caste system. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I have a question here, but it's 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 I just want you to talk about it and I think that this is one of the things we have to understand is that naturalizing inequality is not just something that is done by white western Europeans this happens all over the world that when yeah. you get one group that's dominant to another group that they will want you know one easy and foolproof way of cementing that um, dominance is by framing it as natural as convincing people that I am naturally better than you and that's why I have this position that I have I mean this is a basis of aristocracy and class but it's also the basis of race and caste the caste system in India is predicated on this idea that biologically certain groups of people are suited to different things and they have their place in society and they shouldn't transcend that place um, and even though so much work has been done in recent decades to try and undermine that system and slowly kind of eat away at it, erode it, there is still this lingering um, belief, public belief, which is so widespread that there is something meaningful about caste, that certain caste members are suited to different jobs, that if you belong to the lower caste, you can't do the kind of work that other higher caste people can do. Um, and I was really shocked to find that geneticists, Indian geneticists, when I interviewed them, agreed, you know, believed this, that even though ha they have no data to support it, even though there's no genetic data to support this idea, they believed that certain castes were suited to certain jobs and that there was something biological about this. Um, I have no comment on that. It's just crazy to, to think that. Um... You know, there's one thing that you mentioned in the book is about martial race that, the you know, we're talking about British history here. And the British also did that when they colonized India, where they would. Well, there's not a lot of books about martial race, so it's very hard to explain that. Could yeah. you could you give it a try? Well, so my surname is Saini. My dad's family were in the military. Um, my grandfather fought in the Second World War. My great grandfather fought in the First World War. And um, they've been in the military for a really long time. Um, the Saini surname is designated was designated by the British as a martial race so there were a number of castes that were designated martial races and the idea was that these people make good warriors you're good fighters loyal and you're and this is what you're suited to so it was a caste designation really that the British adopted and reinforced in order to categorize people and you know give them certain roles in this in, in the empire and the colonial project. Um, so it's very difficult to know how far back the Indian caste system goes, the Hindu caste system. 
and what its roots are and how active it was. What we can know is that it wasn't always as rigid as it has seemed in the last couple of hundred years. Yeah. And one thing we can also know is that colonialism reinforced caste. It used caste within it. And in a way, the British inserted themselves into that system. So they weren't a caste as such, but they inserted themselves as a dominant group within that system and worked with it. They didn't eradicate it. They didn't eradicate it. They worked with it. Um, so there have been, a, you know, there's a very big literature looking at the way that colonialism and the caste system interacted and how they supported each other. But, um, you know, just to show how ridiculous the caste system is and how ridiculous it is to think people in this way. In my generation, most of my dad's family do not work in the military, do not serve in the military. Right. We do all kinds of things. And there's nothing stopping us from doing all kinds of things. Obviously we have lots of different talents. We can do everything. And that is the fallacy of caste that you can just do this one thing. That's what you're suited to, that you have a certain quality about you that, that makes you this kind of person. And it's, but it's still hard to kind of move beyond that. You know, people still, I still hear friends of mine, liberal friends of mine talking about caste and how, you know, why that makes them the way they are, or they have certain, you know, that Bengalis are very um, literate and, you know, they're good at poetry and they're, they make wonderful writers and, good readers and that people from here do this and people from there do that and that is one of the pernicious I think legacies of that system is that we reduce people we don't see them as individuals anymore no. we see them in these kind of re reductive ways that erases their personal agency their individualism and just like racism I think that is one of the most damaging things about thinking about people in terms of groups rather than as they are as unique uh, one of the number one question I get in my DMs is, where are you from? Where are you from? And I know <laughs> that they're only asking me that question is because they want to categorize me into something and then kind of make jump judgments and assumptions based on that. Yeah. So, um, when you, how long did this book take to, to write? And, and, you know, you're going around asking a lot of questions. Did you get any kind of uh or, or resistance and after you published the book did you get any harassment by the scientific community oh no the scientific community surprisingly were really receptive so um superior was named a book of the year by loads of um by the smithsonian magazine by nature by a number of different places but when it first came out there was some pushback from especially geneticists who were so angry that I might be pointing the finger at them. Mm -hmm. So they were angry at me for pointing out racism within mainstream science, because for them, as far as they were concerned, the racists were over there. You know, they were the ra the real racists were over there. Why are you pointing the finger at yeah. us? But actually over the last year or two, that narrative has changed dramatically. And particularly with the murder of George Floyd, yeah. there's been a huge reckoning within the sciences and academia that has changed that conversation entirely. There is so much introspection now and people asking themselves, actually, you know, science is not free of blame here, not historically, but also not in the present. And we have to interrogate those legacies and the ways in which we keep these ideas alive if we're going to make science better, not just fairer, but more accurate. You know, we do not have a very accurate science of human difference right now because of the legacy of race. If we want it, if we want to understand ourselves better, then we need to get beyond it. So there was that at the beginning, but I have to say that, you know, over the last two years that has completely transformed. On the other hand, the big backlash I got was from kind of white supremacists. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm not wow. on Twitter anymore. I'm not on Facebook anymore. Yeah. Yeah. They were just, in, they were just terrible. I mean, they wouldn't stop. They came after everyone. They There was a white supremacist magazine online that tracked down my entire family, including my son, who was seven at the time, oh, and God. wrote down all their names and where they were from and tried to psychologically analyze me and why do I write about, you know, why would a woman who is as educated as, as this be perpetuating this, as they saw it, kind of liberal conspiracy around race? So, oh yeah, it's terrible. And they they still do it. <laughs> I still get it now. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry to hear that. 
it's I mean that's what it's like that's what it is yeah you know at the end of your book you have an afterword and it's a really beautiful written passage about identity about identity politics in the society that we live in and I wanted to ask your permission if I can kind of copy paste that and and then put that on a post with obviously credit given so I, I think in this society that we live in right now, identity politics plays a really big part in our lives now. Like it's it's everywhere. How do I go on in a society, especially if you have children in, in a world, in a society that just emphasizes your, tries to categorize you, tries to put you in somewhere and then just yeah. judges you on that? It's tough because we also do it to ourselves, right? We also think in these ways because we have to, because we're navigating a world in which racism is real, discrimination is real. And unless you have a language for it and a way of identifying it, which also means identifying people who are the victims of it, then how, you know, you can't really get beyond that. In that sense, we need identity politics, because how do you recognize discrimination if you're not identifying who is being discriminated against? The problem is um, where that bleeds into these old fashioned ideas about identity being rooted somehow biologically within you. Yeah. You know, sitting inside your body rather than something that the world has imposed upon you, which is what it is. You know, identity doesn't, the way I think about it, and a really useful book for me here was The Lies That Bind by Kwame Anthony Appiah, the philosopher. So he um, talks about it um, almost like a coat that you wear. You know, your identity doesn't necessarily belong to you. It belongs to the people that are looking at you. And it varies depending on where you are in the world. You know, I, I will be categorized differently depending on where I am. And the salience of different aspects of my identity will change depending on where I am. Where right now in New York, my brownness might feel salient to people. My Indianness might feel salient. But when I go to India, it is my caste and my skin shade that becomes salient. In Britain, it may be something else. In South Africa, it may be something else. You know, and that is what it is. It, it's not some kind of fixed thing that you're born with that stays with you for the rest of your life. It's always shifting. It's always changing. And if we can see it in that kind of shifting, changing way, then, then I think we start to see it for what it really is, which is, um, which is a coat. It's a coat. And it really depends on, it, it doesn't really belong to you. It belongs to the person that is looking to, looking at you. Your identity belongs to the person that is looking at you. You have very little control over it in that sense. Um, one of the things I started doing after I wrote Superior was I stopped calling myself British. If people ask me, who are you? Where are you from? I would stop saying British Indian or British Asian. And that's not because... I don't love India, I do. I actually have a very close relationship with the country because I've lived there and I've worked there. I speak Hindi and I speak Punjabi. Um, and I'm very proud of my Indianness, my Indian heritage. But I was born in Britain. And if Britishness is ever going to mean anything more than being white, if it's going to also include the rest of us, yeah. then it can't just be for white British people to be able to say that they're British. We all have to be able to say that we're British. I, want, I don't want Britishness to just mean whiteness. I want it to include me in my brownness, to include my son in all his brownness, however much of a relationship he has to India or not. You know, in generations, if my great-great-grandkids are brown, but they have no relationship, cultural relationship to India whatsoever, how British will they be? I want them to, be, to feel themselves to be fully British. Um, and it's that sense of belonging, I think, we have to be able to cultivate in multicultural societies, because otherwise we're just salami slicing people. Hmm. And the only people who have a right to really belong to that society is that tiny little dominant portion at the top, you know, who get to who get to be the real Americans or who get to be the real British people or the real English people, while the rest of us are real too. And I can be 100% British but also be 100% of Indian heritage. And that shouldn't be mutually exclusive. I, I totally agree. That that was really beautiful. Um, my last question is, what's your next project? What are you working on next? And is there something you would like to, uh, a project you're working on now, or you have something out that you would like to share with the people? Um, no, I'm working on another book. So when the pandemic started, um, I started writing 
this project that I've been thinking about for ages, looking at the origins of patriarchy. So um, in one of my previous books, Inferior, I had a chapter on male domination. And what we know from anthropology is that um, obviously not all human societies are male dominated. Um, and in the past, there would have been many, many more egalitarian societies that we have now. So the question I was always asked was, when did patriarchy begin then? How did it emerge? How did it grow? And that's a question I've been trying to answer for the last two years. It, it won't be finished for a long time. Yeah, that's a big one thing, topic. I think write it, what Writing Superior has helped me do is integrate race and caste and class into that story because the story of patriarchy is not just the story of gender and sex it is also the story of all other forms of inequality they all overlap they all work with each other mm. um, and um, I think it's only by understanding inequality in that way that we really tackle it if we if we isolate different forms of discrimination I don't think we really fundamentally tackle any of them that um, if you know when you have it when the book's released and you like to promote it please let me know i would love to <laughs> to support you in any way i can thanks that's really kind of you I no my pl my honor um anything else you want to talk about anything you want some interesting thing you want to share you i know you're full of wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> no i think that's everything i mean i would add in regards to my previous uh, the previous question about britishness um nothing bothers a British racist or any kind of racist more than for me to say to them, I am as British as you. You know, one of the ways in which the far right works is also by manipulating the divisions that we see within identity politics, yeah. by reinforcing them. So one of the most effective ways is by asserting that sense of unity. As much as we need identity politics, like I just said, when we assert our unity, that nothing undermines racist more than, than that's than, true. You know, when I say I'm English, I'm just as English as you. Nothing scares a racist more than you. it kills them. It kills <laughs> yeah, them. It does. I'm gonna when I write my little biography for you, I'm gonna write British journalist. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this will probably be released out this week. Okay, wonderful. Thank you again for having me. Oh, I really my my pleasure. It. This was amazing. Yes, anyway, was... I can help with your well, if you're ever in New York, please let me know. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Bye.